Right, well, uh, it's lovely to be here this evening. Uh, it's great that you've joined us. And uh, hi, Tommy. Hi, John. Uh, thanks very much for having me. And oh, uh, it's, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Um, and uh, there's a hell of a lot to talk about. So let's crack right on. And I always ask this question straight off. Who, who first put you on a bike? Uh, <clears throat> well, if my, my dad is a is a is a great kind of raconteur, but I, I think his stories um definitely have a bit of poetic license in them. Uh, and he would have you believe that I put myself on a bike, and that when he when he put the um stabilizers on, I threw such a fit that I wouldn't ride the bike with stabilizers on. And of course, off I went and fell off and bloody nose and uh, cut lip. And of course, um I blamed him and went straight to my mum. So that that's my first kind of memory. Of, of riding a bike really but I think it was probably him him put me on it um and that was when I was two and a half something like that before before the uh, advent of balance balance bikes of course oh that would have been so good wouldn't it and uh balance bikes are the best but that well okay so on a bike having a crack how quickly did mountain biking take over well not really till uh 13 or 14 um uh we do a three-tier school system in Northumberland. So when I was at middle school, there was a classroom assistant and her husband was a keen mountain biker and she brought some mountain bike magazines in and I'd read them and I was just captivated by this kind of Miles Rockwell kind of, you know, with his skin suit on, his goggles, his full face helmet, Pete especially, because this was just at the time Pete had won his first World Cup and he was this emerging superstar of the sport. Um, and there were some local trails at Wooler and she wouldn't tell me where they were. So I remember dragging my dad up for about a month and we eventually found them after walking around hundreds of acres around the perimeter of this wood, we eventually stumbled across them. And I remember that I still remember the joy of finding these trails. And of course, when I went back with my bike a few weeks later, I couldn't find them again, but that, that's by the by. And what was your first bike? Do you remember? Um, well, my first uh, bike that I started mountain biking on, I actually had an Apollo 3200 from Halfords, which had 15, 15 index gears and uh, eventually bent the forks doing the old classic pallet and the door jumping over some mates. Um, but my first kind of real mountain bike, if you want to say that, was a, um, a specialised FSR. Um, I can't remember what model it was, but I had 500 quid in savings and I took it all out the bank and I... And I and that's what I bought. I bought that. And was that kind of what gently got you through to, you know, beginning the downhill? Yeah. Racing I, I, and I actually raced that bike downhill for a season when I was a uh, 14. So it had V brakes on and Manitou experts and uh, I was forever blowing the shock and those old specialized FSRs that had a BT linkage kit kit on it. And I was forever snapping the shock ball. It wasn't really built for it, but, uh, I think it stood me in good ground, to be honest, having to kind of muddle through on on that. It was good, good fun, good memories those days. Yeah, sometimes having to muddle through gets you, you know, much further ahead, doesn't it? But how tough was it being a World Cup downhill racer? Um, well, I think I was a good domestic racer primarily, and I was a crap World Cup downhiller. Um, that is how I would describe myself. But it's an interesting... I kind of see World Cup downhill like a social experiment, really, because you've got um, these tend to be hyper competitive individuals in this melting pot. And generally, everybody gets along, but you certainly when it gets to the end of Saturday practice and Sunday when you're racing, there's like a tension develops. And I always really struggled with that, um, to be honest, because I'm quite carefree and happy. And I think you, you get the guys, and, and rightly so, they're, they're very focused on just winning and those kind of niceties kind of go out the window as they should if, if you're going to race and win. But for me, I, I never really got my head around that, to be honest. So I, I did find it quite tough, to be honest, being this. Because I was, at the time when I first started doing it, I was only 18, um, which now would be junior, but of course you were dumped in with the seniors back then. Wow. Um, and it was a bit of a baptism of fire learning that, uh, you know, this was something people took very seriously. And it was a a, a sport. And uh, But I loved it all the same, but I, I just struggled with that uh, with that side of it, I must admit. The sheer pressure. That must have yeah, been tough. Pressure cooker. Yeah. But um, I want to jump forward a bit now, obviously, um, to your accident, 
which resulted in you not having the use of your right arm. How did that happen? And what was the uh, the fallout? Um, well, I had this line of jumps I'd built in a in a quarry owned by a, um, a friend of ours who's, who's a farmer. And it's a jump I'd done hundreds of times. And I went up after work on a Monday night and uh, I just cased the jump. That, it was as simple as that. I just got a bit wrong cased and I got pitched over the bars and I hit a, um, I hit probably, a, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 year old beech tree. And I remember looking at it like I was like an arrow straight into it thinking I'm going to hit that. And of course I did hit it. Um, and I hadn't had any chance to slow down and my head hit it first and then my shoulder comes through and, and hits it. Um, but the kind of the injuries that I had, I uh, just from that one impact, I fractured my skull. I um, I ripped all five nerves out of my brachial plexus, which is a, a plexus that powers your, your arm and actually does your pec and your lats and quite a few other, about 50 or 60 muscles in, in total. I um, had a spinal cord contusion at C3, um, which is which is fairly serious if, if it had been any worse i'd had a bulging disc which is neither here nor there um that was about it really but uh for the first six or eight weeks i can't fully remember i couldn't walk so i was a um i was a paraplegic for the first eight weeks or so um but i could always i could always feel sensation in my toes so i was fairly hopeful that they, that would come back and, and it did um but that was a a strange experience in a way because you can't really be sad about it because you're in the situation and it just is what it is and uh you just kind of have to get on with it and obviously I was very fortunate that I got better um but yeah it's a, a tough situation for and I'm always amazed by people who are you know like Martin and others who have who have kept going and I, I think that's incredible I haven't had a brief window of of knowing what that injury is is like albeit very small and you know without the longevity of it so yeah just just a paralyzed arm and, and that's it got away quite lucky really yeah and right now your bike is a piece of work isn't it that's cool, it's that. incredible yeah. that help you know helps you to ride um you just explain a couple of the things that are on it that make it feasible well I'd actually emailed a, a mate of mine who works at SRAM saying, can I buy a left-handed rear shifter off you? And as is his way, I didn't hear anything for months. And he eventually got back saying, oh, we've got an idea. Um, just want us to do your whole bike. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. And um, so they, they developed a single lever brake system for me with, with a splitter in, which has a little bit more power to the back than the front. Um, so that's a cold lever with le level calipers just for the oil. So one lever, Tommy. One, one lever, yeah. So, um, and I know that sounds really weird to most mountain bikers because you shape your bike with your brakes and stuff like that. But for me, because generally going down the trail fast isn't a thing anymore, it's just getting down it. I'm pretty controlled with my braking. And the benefit of um, reduction in arm pump is way better than being able to pull a skid. Um, so, so that's, and th now I can have a full length grip. Um, they gave me, an access full access system with um with a which is the electric gear set so they gave me some buttons um i actually got a picture of it i can i can um do you want me to share my screen yeah right? yeah yeah bring it up yeah i'll um i'll open it up now so um uh desktop i think is what i, I want to show you give me a quick second um I'm not sure I can do it actually. Um, it share screen at the bottom. I've got some weird privacy. Um, <laughs> here we go. Here we go. I've got it. Right, I, ca I can't do it. Sorry, I apologise. Oh, um, but, but essentially, it, it's given me a full length grip, and I've got a, a Bluetooth dropper post and Bluetooth gear shift and and a single lever all on one side of the bar. Um, which doesn't sound too amazing, but previously I had two brake levers, a dropper post, a grip shift unit, and a grip that was about two inches long. Um, so it's it's totally transformed the way I can ride and, and how far I can ride and even just repetitive strain injury, stuff like that. Um, 
so it's more long term as well how I think it will benefit me. I'll be able to ride for longer without that those little niggles that I was getting. Yeah. And you've you've ridden some fairly serious stuff, mate, haven't you? Since you've done well, that arm. I have, but I've also fallen off on some trying some fairly serious stuff as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um I've been into hospital twice with my paralyzed arm already in a sling, saying, I think I broke my arm. And they, and they say, why is it in a sling? And I'm like, oh, right, there's a long story here. So <laughs> I, um, I got a spiral fracture in my humerus. Um, oh, bloody. And I chipped, chipped my elbow. Um, but of course, it was fine because really the treatment was just to be normal and just keep my arm in my sling like I normally do. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a, a, you know, a bit of a funny one. We, I guess it's obvious uh, that... The accident must have changed your view of mountain biking or how you treat mountain biking, how mountain biking inspires you now. Yeah, I think it did. And uh, <clears throat> it's a, uh, I think we were chatting about it the other day. The, um, my brain hasn't changed in how I perceive speed, but I physically can't match that now. Um, so I ride slower, but that means when I'm riding slower, I can often afford to look around. Um, because I'm quite comfortable so uh, in a way it's um, inadvertently I started taking in things I was noticing a lot more um, uh, you'll see lines appearing you'll see where water's moving um, you'll look at landscapes more often so it actually completely changed the enjoyment I got from mountain biking where I was really all about and, and there's nothing wrong with this at all I'm, I'm at pains to say that I you know totally accept that people want to shred the turns and ride as hard as you can and and i totally get that i think it's amazing but i can't do that anymore so it just changed the way that i uh i mountain bike now um the the enjoyment i get comes much for, much more from uh the environment that i'm in i still like riding a good turn and and riding fast when i can but it's much more a uh, fuller experience i think now for me personally and does the because your 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 love of the right outdoors is obvious. Um, you describe yourself um, as a pragmatic environmentalist. Um, this the 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 Tommy that used to be, and the Tommy that there's there's elements that are still exactly the same. But yeah. you, you is it the reason that you've gone into this love of the environment and conservation? Is that part of the accident or was it was it already in you i think it was already in me but i think that that component of me has been moved up up the ladder if you like um and we all have different priorities um but i suppose that that priority just moved up for me when um when i had the opportunity to to do so and the circumstance to do so um and i love it so I've got nothing to complain about at all. It, it's great. And, and if I, if by some miracle I woke up tomorrow morning with two arms, I think I probably wouldn't go back to how I was. I would probably stay how I am now. And I think it's important that you explain now, or you know, this is, this is going to be where we're going to really get stuck in. What are you trying to achieve in your locality and achieve it? I think... The, the Cheviots are quite a complex environment, um, for, for want of a better term. It's vast. It's huge. Um, it's economically not that resilient. Um, we're very dependent on upland farming, um, some of which has done fantastically well, some of which has done not so well. Um, we do have elements of recreation, within the Cheviots, again, some of which has done quite well, some of which isn't. And mountain biking largely hasn't featured within that. Sure, we had Derek Purdy and some other guys a, a long time ago, but the sport's moved on a, a heck of a lot since then. And there's no real provision for that, but there is a demand for it. Um, so that has created tension in some respects um, because people who live there want to do it. So my big role is looking at um, changes that are gonna going to be happening in the Cheviots within the next five years through through policy, which is unrelated to mountain biking, but will have an effect on it, potentially positive. Um, how forestry is changing, um, how we as mountain bikers are changing, and trying to bring all of that together to say, actually, we can be an asset 
if you work for natural england if you work for the national park if you're a farmer if um, you work for the environment change you're looking at river health actually as mountain bikers we, we can come on board with you and we can work with you and we get what we want and hopefully you get what you want and going a bit deeper then um because i mean let's be honest there is an obvious schism between um certain elements of the rural community and mountain biking um how uh, how can mountain biking really be a benefit to not just a local economy but also to um maybe conservation and the environment well, here, here's a, a real life example. So the Naughty Northumbrian, the re only reason I'm involved with the Naughty Northumbrian was as a proof of concept to show that mountain biking could exist in an upland environment. So the field that we rent from the Naughty Northumbrian is in what's called an arable reversion scheme. It's right next to a triple SI burn. And I get on really well with a farmer, um, but like anybody, he, he, he needs money. Um, now, that arable reversion scheme ends uh, next year and he could put it back to crop and use pesticides and insecticides and that will leach into this triple si burn which is really important for migratory fish but through the money that we have put into the field by renting it off him for three days a year he can now afford to keep it in the arable reversion scheme which is a meadow which has no inputs to it no fertilizers no insecticides nothing so that's a real life simple example of how mountain biking can can help the environment it helps the land it actually helps the local community because they're all on board with the event it helps bring people there so it kind of establishes it as a kind of um the beginning of a i'm not going to say a destination but an area where you can go and ride your bike mm -hmm. um so so that, that's a really simple example there's Sorry, go on, John. No, no, I was, I was, I'm pretty sure you were just about to talk about what I was going to say, because um, essentially um, the access is a massive factor. Well, no, maybe you weren't. What were you going to say? Go on. Well, no, I, I was actually going to go on about that, so I'm quite happy for you to, to lead. Yeah. You don't access. Know. Access. Again, this seems to be a massive issue. We know what's happened in Scotland. Um, that we that basically they've completely changed the rules of access, um, but the um, the pressure against that in England is massive. And how do you feel about that? It's in all honesty, it's quite difficult because I'm in a very fortunate position in Northumberland. Um, even though we're governed by the same access laws as everywhere else in England, we don't have the same population pressures that. Uh, the rest of England does because we're the most rural county um, per per capita per population per square kilometer even, um, and where I live is a uh, much more remote than the rest of Northumberland, which is already quite rural. However, uh, I do think we need a change in in the law for access. Um, I do feel like we are disconnected with nature on so many levels whether that's food production whether that's soil health field health how nature works what's natural what isn't natural um and i think the only way we're going to get that is by allowing people into these environments now that is difficult to manage because invariably there are going to be some bumps along the road when you do that but i think the benefits do outweigh the positives largely in my view yeah, and I think that again that we're trying to start. I say we, you know, right, Sheffield, yourself. We're, we're trying to start a big, de bigger debate about this because um, there's always uh, crazy stuff said about mountain biking and how mountain biking affects the natural world. Um, what's your view of that? Well, I mean, I think it's a question of scale, in all honesty, because, um, you know, there's 14% of uh, rivers in England in good ecological health. I'm pretty sure mountain bikers didn't cause that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that wasn't us. Um, I'm pretty sure we haven't uh, caused, you know, all the soil degradation that we've got. I'm pretty sure we haven't dried the peatlands out. 
Um, so for me, it's a bit of it's an annoying conversation, but but I can also understand it because I think traditionally people see uh, people see mountain bikes and they think motocross bike, and as ridiculous as that sounds to you and me, I think that does exist. Um, it certainly exists where I am. So yeah, I spend a lot a long time speaking to people about this, um, but I also think as mountain bikers, um, a lot of the time we're actually very engaged with with what we're seeing what we're riding on um and we're always quite keen to learn there's people i go out riding with um in the national park up here and i think oh god they're going to be bored if i see a kestrel or if i see a hen harrier or a goshawk and uh, i took one guy out and he's he's out and out motocross and um we saw a goshawk for the first time and honestly he was amazing he hasn't shut up about it for three weeks um so that was an example of actually he sees it and now he thinks it's amazing and there's a trail that gets shut because of um well the 1981 um, wildlife act and he could never understand and i was saying to him you know you've got to give them a chance to fledge as boring as i sound like a broken record and now he's seen it he's like right now i get it um so so i think we are um as mountain bikers we are keen to to engage with the natural world more so than people give us credit for yeah i mean i think um your film, in, in your film, you've, you've interviewed Danny Udall, yeah. who um, is just our best local land manager. No, no question about that. Um, but his idea is that the most important thing is education. And that's what you've touched upon, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, I think education's a, a bit of a... Um... It's a funny term because I think it can switch people off, but essentially that's what you're trying to do. And even if you're even if you're just doing that through a conversation, through, you know, just going out riding and having having the crack, um, and that's that's what it comes down to. For me, that's the best way. You know, if I try and do it formally, people are just like, "Oh, shut up, Tommy, man, you're boring me." But if I do it when when we're out riding, it's a totally different experience because you're immersed in it. Um, so trying to do this stuff from a classroom or online zoom it, it for me personally doesn't really get it it doesn't really work and i think it, it depends how you learn but for a lot of mountain bikers if you can do it while you're having that fun experience which comes back to access um it is a surefire way to to win win yeah i, I completely get it uh, i can i can i come up please because i want to see a goshawk i've never seen a goshawk so that's, yeah, that's, yeah. um <laughs> But yeah, I, I completely understand what you mean, that, that education is a bit of a dodgy word because it, it, you know, we're mountain bikers, we're all rebels, we're not going to be educated, but going out and just learning, that, that's the way to do it, isn't it? Oh, c completely. And um, I, I just think it's having a conversation and it, it, it's, it's stripping it right back to basics. Um, you know, you can draw on all sorts of... Um, social science learnings and everything like that. Um, but I think fundamentally it comes down to having a conversation with people and being passionate about what you're into. And that rubs off on other people. Um, and sure, not everybody's going to be interested. That's fine. That's life. But if you can convert 50, 60% of the people you go riding with to be interested in these things without even trying um, a lot of the time, I think that that's absolutely amazing. And I get a big buzz out of that actually. Um, there's, there's a few people I go out riding with and we'll start chatting and they'll ask about this and they'll ask about that and I'll say, well, that species won't get planted again or, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they come back and say, oh, you know, I went away and, and read up on what you were talking about. I couldn't believe that, you know. And then the conversation goes further and then you talk about trail design and trail management and all these different things. And um, it's, it's, it's brilliant. I, I get such a kick from it and you wouldn't be able to do any of that without access. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the link, isn't it? Um, because I, I, I believe, I've always believed, believed, and uh, when we, when I was climbing, you know, that that was also part of it. Um, and and actually, the um, the idea that there's a split between different user groups is just so wrong, because we're only, we've only got access to seven percent of our landmass, so. If we had access to a greater degree of our land mass, that would help do exactly what you're saying, wouldn't it, Tommy? It, it would help people to 
just become attached to nature. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, I think you see it in, um, oh, I don't know if culture is the right word or not, but certainly I feel there's elements of the Scottish culture that are much more connected to the outdoors than English culture if if i can go there with with that split nationality but um <laughs> yeah controversial yeah it is um <laughs> but, but i think that that's because that they, they, and i don't think that's an inherent thing i think that's because they have the land reform act 2003 so they can do it yeah. and it's part of their society um so they grew up with it as an expectation that they can do that whereas in england we want to do it and i think a lot of people want to have that access but it, it's not an expectation that we can so, so that just changes things slightly. And, and again, I want to go back to Danny Udall because um, he describes or he uses the term conservation industry. Um, and for me, you know, Danny's at one end of the spectrum and some elements of the conservation industry are at the other end. And he believes that pulling people in, making people part of the 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 fold you know part of the um, that conservation body um, helps massively to to bring it all together. Oh, hugely! Um, you know, there's um, well, the, the local access forum. There's there's another mountain biker on it, but I recently got invited invited onto it, and and I'm not sure if, if I'll do it or not. But I've been chatting to to all the all the other members on it, and um, a lot of them just you know. They were shocked to start with because they couldn't believe mountain bikers were actually interested in this, um, which yeah. I thought, you know, bamboozled me. Um, but actually, as I've, as I've spoken to them, actually, you know, it's a little bit of a, an, an elbow nudge. Actually, you, you mountain bikers, you're not actually that bad, are you? Um, <laughs> I can completely agree with that. Yeah. I can remember meeting um, a birdie guy a uh, guy from the Sheffield Bird Study Group, um, at, a, at a stakeholders meeting, and telling him, oh, I saw a great grey shrike the other day. And it was like, flipped him over. And he's like, what? Wow, wow, where did you see that? And it was, oh, okay. So you're a mountain biker, but you know about birds. Yeah. So bring us into the fold. Yeah. Make us part of, of the, the, the great outdoor, because we have been pushed to the side. But I, I guess I've got to ask a question. There are certain reasons why we've been pushed aside, aren't there? What there are things that mountain bikers do that drive us mad, aren't there? Yeah, uh, yeah, there are. Uh, you know, I think yeah, hold our hands up. But but I also think it's a little bit chicken and egg. I've been as guilty as any anyone in the past of it. Um, but it's a bit of chicken and egg when there's there's not been a discussion, and you feel like you push the edge of, you know that social um cohesion if you will of the outdoors and in invariably if you want to do something you're probably just going to go and do it yourself and you're not going to engage with anybody if they're not engaging with you mm. um, so i think uh, both both sides need to look at that um as well rather than just saying our oh, mountain bikers have done some bad stuff we have but also we've not been part of the conversation we're not allowed we haven't been allowed to be part of the conversation so that's changing and that's good and i think it's going to take a little while for that to filter all the way through um, between both sides, between your average mountain biker and your landowner or your stakeholder or whatever. But it's definitely improving. And what you guys are doing in Sheffield, I think is way ahead of where most other areas and, and organizations are. And that, that to me is a, a real highlight. And Danny, what, what you guys are doing with him, I mean, I mean, that's a wildlife trust saying, yeah, mountain bikers, cool. I mean, that's yeah. a real case in point. Yeah, I, I, I think as a case study, it, it would be brilliant. But um, um, I, I guess I want to go back to envir the environmental industry, oh, sorry, the conservation industry. How do we begin to turn them around as well? I mean, there are parts of, uh, there are conservationists, there are parts of the envir uh, conservation industry who just, have difficulty dealing with the idea that we can be part of the solution how do we get to them i think it depends on them um, i do quite a lot of work with a fourteen thousand acre estate um 
which is brilliantly managed, in all honesty. Um, there's some great, uh, great kind of holistic model grazing farming on there. Um, uh, they've got some wonderful riparian plant and the water's managed well, the peatlands managed really well. And they've always been a little bit unsure of mountain biking, to be honest, even though we do ride there. Um, and, I, and I get on quite well with the estate manager. And what is interesting is that, and this is where the chief, it's interesting with the chief, it's, I think agricultural policy is almost, is almost helping us in a way. Um, if you step aside whatever your political beliefs are, the Elms and the Ag Bill could actually help us as mountain bikers because of the way the subsidies are changing, the way that'll, that'll almost force hands in the way land use is managed. Um, there might be subsidies for access and recreation on there. So that conversation is actually, a lot of it's being done for us. And we're pushing at an open door to a certain extent. Now we're maybe not aware of those changes coming in, so I think that's something we all need to kind of uh, distribute that information to more mountain bike groups. And we've got a few years to get organized to do that. Three or four years, maybe more actually in the Uplands, about seven. Um, so I think that's going to be one route to do it. There's going to be a top-down policy decision that's going to help us to do that. Uh, the other thing for me largely, again, comes back to having these conversations as a human rather than going in as a mountain biker first i speak to stephen who's the estate manager i have a chat with him he's into his karate he's into his birds um he's into all sorts of different stuff and um i turned up with my i was actually doing some photography work up there and i, and I had my e-bike and he thought it was amazing so i'll oh, give us a go then and off he went and i didn't see him for two hours um you know and now he's got himself a non-e-bike mountain bike so that was just an example of and suddenly because he's riding it and he actually understand how it works he actually knows it's not a motorbike so he knows the impact of the flora and the fauna isn't as bad as he previously thought it was now you can't do that with everybody you can't take an e-bike around to everybody and say have a go but just by having that conversation with him he was willing to get on the bike and he had to go all right okay this is interesting i quite like this and actually i haven't uh you know i haven't made the grand canyon down the side of the hill like i thought i was gonna so uh, I think, but I think in the wider context of um, the conservation industry, I think that's going to be a slog. I, I think it is going to be hard, but it's turning up, showing up, being at the meetings and spreading that load. If you've got a trail organization, you've got to spread the load and don't just burden it on one person. You've got to have five or six of you to, to share that load, I think, because it, it, it's tiring and it's fatiguing. And um, we, we kind of mountain bike to have fun as well as go at meetings, if I'm honest. And, and it's giving back, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think, um, you know, that's been a, a massive part of how we've managed to influence Wildlife Trust, uh, Danny and the uh, National Trust and RSPB, is by giving back. And that's what mountain bikers have got to do, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we've made leaky dams um, near some of our trails to, to slow the flow of water. I mean, the, the Coca to Spate River. Um, so the more we can reduce that, that down slow it down the, the better um a lot of that we did off our own back where maybe we shouldn't have but some people noticed and they thought it was great um so so that kind of opened some doors to to conversations we funded some riparian tree planting we've done days with the rivers trust um and we've we've kind of just framed that as a bit of a laugh all right let's go and um, plant some alder let's go and plant some willow see see whether we like it and uh, we turn up in the there's all the fishermen there. What do you do? We're mountain bikers and <laughs> you end up having this uh, really funny conversations when you're doing it. But it's good. You get a sauna, you get a cup of tea, you get a crack, um, you plant some trees or you put lay some sphagnum moss or you block some block some grips or whatever we've been doing. Um, we've even be actually been helping a landowner clear um, South Seed and Sitka spruce. You just go in and you just cut it out. Um, and we do that for a day. Um, and that, that's, you know, he's now willing to let us put a little trail on his land in exchange for that. There you go. And I think actually doing conservation work is great, apart from I planted sphagnum moss one day and it nearly killed me. It's been bent double all day. That's tough. That's not, I don't mind digging, they're planting trees, great. But you can also do it, can't you, by if, if you 
are looking after bridleways within uh, SSSI or uh, a nature reserve, it's actually saving them time and they can get on with doing the stuff they really want to do. Well, the, they'll never admit it, but they're all resource stretched. Every agency is completely resource stretched. Um, at, at the back of Rothbury, there's a, um, just on the, it's a national park boardwalk actually. And um, it's got loads of cracked boards in it. And uh, I thought, oh, do we do it? Don't we do it? And we spoke to the ranger and he said, well, you could actually speak to the county council. Um, he said, and, and put in and asked them to repair it. He said, oh, you can just go and do it yourselves um, and, and get it done. And we went and did it. And our relationship with him has improved quite substantially. And I mean, it, it's and it's not completely altruistic because we want to ride it as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it is a bit selfish, um, but it's good for everyone as well. Um, you know, we get to ride it. It protects the wider environment. That's essentially what a path does if it's well maintained. Um, and people do start to notice. I mean, even things like um, we, we have one trail that comes down past um, the local Yowths go camping there. And I mean, they always leave it in such a mess. I mean, there's broken glass everywhere. And, and uh, we clean it up once, say, every three months or something. And um, the local county council, he just loves this. And he sticks it all over Facebook. And actually, that's helped us as a, as a biking community again. Because oh, actually, those guys and girls, they go, and, uh, they go and clear up all that litter up there and all that broken glass. And it's just a simple thing. It, it takes us like an hour and a half to do it, something like that. If there's three or four of us, it's dead easy. And I guess, you know, we've got trash free trails. Um, you've got different groups throughout the country. And do you, when you've been going around the country doing your film, um, have you seen a, a, a greater um, enthusiasm from those groups or, do you, or greater influence from those groups? If there is. It's been interesting doing this film because I think it's quite dependent on the situation that you're in, um, in where you are. And that's not a bad thing. Um, for instance, in the Tweed Valley, I think they're very well organised, but they can have a, a pretty much a primary focus on purely the trails because there's already that, um, there's already that infrastructure there. Um, they don't really have a massive problem with litter or everything else. So they can pretty much focus on, yeah, we want to get these trails in. They don't have to say, we need to clean up the litter. We need to do this and we need to do that. Whereas some of the guys when I see in South Wales, um, they do have more of a problem with it. And the stuff they're doing is absolutely brilliant. Their trails aren't official yet, but they're actually working with, um, well, unofficially with um, Natural Resource Wales. And the amount of litter cleans they're doing, and there's people, um, there's a cafe there. So it makes the whole environment nicer for everybody. And that makes the mountain bikers much more socially accepted. Mm. They're, they're now just part of it. In fact, it's not even a big deal anymore that mountain bikers ride in this wood because they're doing so much good there. And I, I mean, what, 15 years ago, Inalithan was a ghost town, wasn't it? And now it's buzzing. It was different, yeah, that's for sure. Um, well, I think obviously they had they had the mills, they had a lot of industry, and then it went through that kind of low period. Mm. Um, and I think a, a, a number of different factors, including mountain biking, have, have really helped uplift in mm. Leithen. Nice. Yeah. Sorry, go on. I just I just think the transformation there, um, and mountain biking has has had a pretty big role in that. It's not the sole factor. Mm. It's had a pretty big role in that. Yeah, I think yeah, tourism to Scotland is growing hasn't it? But it, yeah, definitely mountain biking has been a factor. Um, how do you think, Tweed Valley is a, a, a little bit of a, it is a case study, isn't it? In a sense. Um, how do you think the, the guys are getting on working with Forestry Scotland and local conservationists? Generally good. Um, it's not Go be careful what I say here. <laughs> I don't want to speak for anybody. Um, it's not plain sailing, but I don't think you would ever expect it to be plain sailing. And when you're an agile, nimble group made up of five or six really driven people working with a national agency, there's a bit of a disparity there in the speed you expect things to be done. Um, so it, it's taken longer than I think people thought it would to to um, 
to get the trails official and to do things on a more organized basis but it is happening albeit slowly so i think that's a positive because it is happening and the discussions are ongoing um they've obviously got their zoning plan now um which they've put in and i think that's been generally fairly well accepted by the mountain bike community there which is good um so zoning plan effectively just saying there's certain areas that you can build trails and yeah yeah i think i think one of the concerns forestry um and scotland had was that mountain biking was becoming so big there that it was actually impacting other recreational users so if you go to a certain forest that you've always thought it was pretty tranquil and suddenly you turn up to the car park and there's 60 vans there it's just a change of the experience of that forest mm. um but i think they've managed it really well because there's still a huge area where you can ride your bike but they're saying just take it a bit easy in there um you can have a couple of trails but we don't really want to push that because we know that this many people want to go there for for a bit of peace and quiet and mm completely tranquil and, and that, that's worked quite well and they did that with mountain bikers that just wasn't a unilateral this is how it is you're not going there they actually worked with them to to develop that so i think that was a positive as well because in the past that would have just been one of these big exclusion zones that never work um so i think i think that's working quite well and i i have the sense that it's working better there than it's pretty much working anywhere else um in the uk i think i think tweed valley well i think it's like this um it's like a rolling stone isn't it it's built up this head of steam and it's it's you know it, it started with guys like uh, tom ferguson and dick hamilton way back in the late 80s early 90s doing what this. a builder dick hamilton yeah i mean and I think people forget about that. That kind of kickstarted the whole thing, really. And it, and it's developed and developed. And then there's been government money. There's been a massive community. It's now got this huge scene. So actually, to you know, everybody's involved in that now. The government, local community, business owners, riders. Yeah, it's not always smooth, plain sailing. But on the whole, it it's really positive. And I think once you build that head of steam, it's kind of hard to undo that, really. Yeah, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, obviously, the, the trail building, the local trail building that's going on is second to none. Um, but actually, I think the seven stains are actually falling to bits. It's quite interesting that you've got some really positive stuff, but the seven stains haven't had the investment they need. Yeah, I am. Um, can we be careful here again? We interviewed somebody from Natural Resource <laughs> Wales last week. And um, I, I kind of sit there. I, I don't do the interviews, and I don't I don't say too much. But but at one point he said we have um, last year we had three hundred thousand riders use our official trail centres, and we had five hundred and fifty six thousand riders use the unofficial trail network. And in the same sentence he said that gives us a real problem because um we don't have the resource to put in to manage the unofficial trail network. And I said, well, how much are you putting into your official trail network? And it was a substantial amount of money. And I said, well, surely if the more demand is there for the unofficial trail network, why don't you take some of that money and put it into that one? Um, and to be fair, he, he, he answered it. Uh, I mean, I think it was probably, you know, it, it was not for him to answer that. He gave it a good crack. I think it's probably, a, you know, a level above him where those tens of millions go. Um, but I think that needs looked at as well. You know, if if you're getting, I can't remember what the amount of kilometres of trails he said have been built. Um, and he said, for the most part, they're actually pretty good. Um, he said, sure, there's some we have to take out because it's, you know, it's rotten pallets or whatever. But he said, for the most part, they're pretty good. And I said, you know, let's say you've had a thousand kilometres of trail built for free. You know, that's essentially an asset to you guys. You're pretty much saying as much, but then you don't want to put any money into it to help, you know, whether you give the money to the trail associations, whether you help them or whether you work with them, that's still not a, a comfortable thing for these big agencies to do, but it is becoming more so. And I think that should happen. And I think it has to happen. Yeah. And, and you, you were talking about North Wales there, were you? Uh, South Wales. Primarily. Oh, South Wales. Yeah, I know there's loads. But 
there's an increasing number being built in North Wales and the response has been to basically fell trees over some of the trails there. And, and that's, that's exactly the reverse of what you're saying. Um, they should be talking to those builders. They should, because there's, there's been studies done in Scotland and in Wales, hasn't there, uh, which, which um, have, have said how much money has been brought in by mountain biking in those areas. Yeah, and it's, and it's not even just the direct economic impact. It's the health benefits, the mental health benefits. Of course. It's more sustainable than a lot of other industries. Um, so there is an environmental benefit. Um, that sure there's an impact, but it's not as bad as um, <coughs> you know, it's not as bad as coal mine. That's for sure. Um, so I, I think um, you know, there's there's much wider than just um, I think we do focus on the economic benefit of it quite a lot, but I think there's there's much more wider wider benefits to it as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think I hope that the outdoor city Sheffield uh, knows just how many thousands of kids have used the trails that we've built but you you do have that sense that it does all come down to economics doesn't it and i guess that's the slightly worrying thing yeah i mean that um it is worrying and i think that's where trail associations and actually mountain bikers as a passionate bunch who are quite engaged and and largely willing to go and build their own trails um and i think most mountain bikers if you can come to an agreement with a landowner and they say, right, um, we don't want you going in there, but you can go in there. Um, then, then that, then that's, I think most mountain bikers will accept that. Um, I think you have to have that agreement in place. Um, because of, you know, if you're just going to build, I don't think we should be building unofficial trails willy nearly everywhere. Mm. I think, I think that's a problem. Yeah. Um, but it's how you take those trails and make them official because I, you know, there should be a route to do that. Yeah, that's interesting. And if they need to go, sometimes they're going to need to go and we're going to have to accept that. You know, if, if they're in the wrong place, the wrong situation, if they're dangerous, fine. They go and I, and I totally accept that. Yeah. I, I mean, has your view changed while you've been making the film? Um, you know, is it, is it sort of uh, evolved while you've been making the film? Um, it has, yeah, and, and it, it ebbs and flows to be honest because I hear both sides of the coin quite a lot. Um, and I do definitely empathize, empathize with both sides. I'm definitely more on the side of engaging with and working with landowners to mitigate risk, um, you know, even liability, which is an economic thing fundamentally, and at times a health and safety thing. Um, of course that is a, a real human concern you know i don't want to come down a trail oh i don't want to be say pushing my little baby boy and somebody comes out of a trail across a footpath and whacks them and you know there's going to be a conflict there that's quite serious so but that's a common sense thing largely which sometimes we do lack as mountain bikers occasionally um but i think um it's been interesting and i think even these big bodies like forestry england what has been interesting is how um, there's no real policy. So you'll get one recreation manager in one area who's quite engaging and will work with you to say, uh, no, not there for this reason. Yes, here's an area. Get your trails in there or you can link this to that and, and you'll go to another area where the conversation just won't happen. Um, and that's been interesting to see the difference mountain bikers have with a view to working with landowners largely because of their current relationship so that's been challenging yeah but and i i know i sense a difference between scotland and wales and england massive yeah because yeah. They, they've kind of got it um and england well the, the forestry england just or the forestry commission is it still called that Forestry England now. Forestry England. They don't seem to have that ability to uh, negotiate, to chat to, to just work with mountain bikers. We're getting there um, in our area. Um, I mean, Northumberland has Kielder as its only official riding destination. There are others that are 
are managed on a low key level with engagement from forestry England. The rest of it's completely unofficial or they tolerate it. Um, but trying to engage with them on those is is difficult. It's taken about five years from it being ignored to even have a conversation. Um, and that is tiring. Whereas in, you know, with filming, for instance, um, when we went up to the Tweed Valley, uh, we needed to access some of the trails and Forestry Land Scotland said, sure, fine, come and pick the key up for the gate. Then got the key, yeah, as long as you take your time. And that trust between us and them was great. Uh, other areas, we didn't, we didn't want to access it with a vehicle at all. We wanted to walk up and uh, that was a real issue. And it was hurdle after hurdle after hurdle just to film there. Um, because we tried to do things the official way. So I suddenly had a lot of empathy for people who'd been trying to do things the official way. And it's hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. And eventually they say, you know what? Forget it. We're just going to carry on. So I do empathise with it. I don't think it's right, but I empathise with it. Yeah, it, it is almost the case of if you, if you don't talk to people, uh, if you don't talk to mountain bikers, then they'll probably just get arsy and just go and build trails anyway. But I, I just want to put the word out to, to everyone who's listening. Um, if you want to ask a question, fire one at us now. I've got one from Mike. Unofficial trails are all very well, but how are these covered for risk insurance? Well, they're not. They're not. No. They're not. So um, the way it works with Forest Land Scotland, and this is where the Trade Association becomes quite important because you're looking to mitigate risk. So that requires a degree of trail management. So uh, Forestry Land Scotland and Forestry England don't have insurance policies because they think it's too expensive. So somebody's made an economic decision somewhere that um, it's cheaper not to not to be insured. So if uh, a person X rides an unofficial trail that is fine, flowy, 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 they come across a wooden feature and it collapses and they break their neck. Um, and that trail isn't an official trail Forestry England or Forestry Land Council can be held liable for that, um, especially if they know that that feature was there. Um, and they then have to make a decision to fight that case, settle it, um, and they're their they're the two options, really. Um, but what the Trail Association comes in with Forestry Land Scotland, you say, okay, we're the Trail Association, we'll uh, fill in a form, every two months we'll do the trail inspection. So if we see that feature is getting rotten, we raise it, we shut the trail. And there's a big sign saying trail closed, dangerous feature. And they have deemed in Scotland that that mitigates the risk enough for them should the accident happen and it goes to court that they have an evidence trail that they'll win that case. So, so that's the measures they're putting in by working with mountain bikers to manage those trails. Which is sensible. Yeah, I mean... It's, I, I guess the, the big question for me would be surely there should be legislation that says if you go out and do a dangerous sport, if you go and climb, if you go mountain bike, it's up to you. I mean, it starts at home, doesn't it? You bought yeah. that mountain bike, you've made that decision that you're going to take that risk. Yeah. Um, and that's my view completely with it. And I think that's, I think that's probably a separate, um, a separate thing that needs to be taken up because I think at the minute we're trying to work within what's there at the minute, even though I don't think it's, necessarily right i think we have more of a problem if a pedestrian gets hit um uh, yeah, absolutely if if you know you've built a trail that goes straight across a footpath and we've had we've had examples of this in Rothley where, where we changed them you change the exits and which always hasn't always been popular but if you come down there and you whack a pedestrian um you know they have actually been upholding their responsibility you know if they can't see you that's not their fault yeah uh, and that's where it gets uh, you know that's a threat to mountain biking actually yeah um, uh, if you if you cause injury to someone else then that's a totally different matter if you cause injury to yourself then basically that's your lookout yeah yeah it's um it, the, basically should we as mountain bikers or actually as the outdoor community should we be pushing for that as a piece of legislation uh, I, I would like to see it. Um, I don't. I wouldn't know where to start if I'm perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think so. I think. Um, I mean, 
yeah, it doesn't do anybody any good in in the long run. This kind of um, I think you, you, your personal responsibility fills fills into your social responsibility. In in my view, and if you're gonna go and ride that bike and make that decision, um, it, you know that's 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 your decision. You know, I didn't. You know, I where I did my arm, I built the jump, and uh, yeah, Huey who owns the land, he didn't actually know about it, um, and he was totally fine with it in the end. Um, but you know, it's like, could I have actually? You know, he didn't know about it. Could have actually sued him? Potentially could have. I mean, and how ridiculous would that have been? Well, there, there I think I, I don't think there have been many um, successful cases, su successful suits. No, and I don't. I, I don't think there's been one, has it? I don't think mountain bikers would. I think there's, there was one in Delamere Forest, I think, a, a long time ago, where um, they had a set of dirt jumps in Delamere and somebody had dug a big borrow pit. So the guy actually cased the jump and uh, he was fine, but he he he, he, was, he became a tetraplegic because oh, he had yeah. a borrow pit that someone had dug. Yeah. So the, the dirt jumps got flattened there because of that. And, and that still gets brought, but that was a long time ago now. Um, as shocking as it was um so i think uh yeah i don't think it's that common but i guess uh, the filming you've been doing how much fun has that been i mean you you bumped into loads of people you must have had some seriously good discussions oh it's been good yeah um and the the range of views we've had on the subject has been massive which shows that the bit the debate's still there and we're still figuring our way out through it and i think it also shows that um uh, i think uh, overall policy is going to be quite hard to implement because i think different areas have different pressures so that's what i think working on a local level is going to be really important and having a little bit of flexibility in whatever policy comes out dependent on the location yeah um, and loads of different issues some people uh you know conservation issue massive other people liability um other people litter anti-social behavior and but for the most part people wanting to work with people and just have pretty much good honest fun generally um and not uh, and not upset anybody for the most part i've not met anybody who's really gone out to want to upset people and if they've done it inadvertently they have held their hands up and say look yeah okay we acknowledge that how do we so sort it um and i think that's been quite encouraging so on the whole, it's been pretty positive. Largely, yeah. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. It's been good. Fantastic. Um, I want to ask again, any more questions? Anyone want to sling a question in? Stick it on the chat. If not, I think we've had a cracking chat, Tommy. Um, I think it's been really quite enlightening because this we, we are getting to the point where mountain biking is moving on isn't it it, it is having to to make a, a, a quantum leap yeah i think so and i think one thing i would sort of add is um it change isn't always comfortable and um you know I, i've been a mountain biking a long time and, I, and i've not always uh, appreciated change but it happens and it's part of life. And I think if we don't, if we're not at the table, decisions will be made for us. So we have to engage and get to the table. That's really important. And that's going to be for the benefit of, for all of us, actually, whether you're a walker, a horse rider, a mountain biker or whatever. Um, so I think having our seat at the table is, is really crucial. Yeah, well, I think that's a cracking finishing point. Um, any more questions? Matt, has anything come through? Uh, no, no, no more questions come through. Um, you mean we've been that good? Nobody's got any questions? Well, you've been very good. Yeah, <laughs> I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. You know, I'm uh, first and foremost a climber, but I do have a mountain bike and I do ride trail centres and unofficial trails from time to time. So it's been, yeah, fascinating. Um, I, I guess I've got a question. Um, you know, the... As, as a climber, I mentioned at the start of the talk that uh, you coerced me into taking over the uh, chairing of the BMC. So the BMC, for those who don't know, it's the British Mountaineering Council. 
they have an area committee, so I chaired the uh, peak area for three years. Very well, mate. Very uh, well. Yeah. I don't think you ever came to a meeting after you'd left. Um, I did one. <laughs> um, but to my knowledge, you know, you've got British Cycling as this kind of overarching body looking at cycling for the UK, but there isn't a national English, let alone um, English and Welsh or Scottish climbing, uh, sorry, cycling, uh, mountain biking, um, a uh, federation like the BMC, is there? You've talked a lot about trail associations and Ride Sheffield and groups here and there. Is is part of the issue not that you can kind of join those join those groups together in uh, in something, or, or 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 do you see lessons learn lessons from the BMC and think let's not go there? Well, it, I think interestingly, uh, I don't know whether you were aware of it, Tommy. But we were trying to get Open MTB going. Um, which was uh, basically we we were hoping that would become a national body, and it was kind of based on the BMC um, map. Um, I not clubs forming a, um, a, a national body, but groups from around the country. Um, but uh, what do you think, Tommy? Is um, um, well, I, I, it's it's an interesting question because I see, um, I think Mike had asked, uh, how do we change the view of underwriters for trail builder insurance? Well, um, British Cycling can help with that, oddly enough. Um, but I think British Cycling, I don't think trail creation and trail provision is really high on their agenda, mm. is my viewpoint on it, to be... Um, um, and I don't know why that is, um, if I'm, I'm not qualified to, to speak on that, really, because I just don't know. Um, but we don't really have that voice, a uh, collective voice like like climbing does. Um, and I think the BMC, not that I'm a climber, but my father-in-law is a member of the BMC, and it feels like the BMC permeates through to climbers of all levels. But we definitely don't have that in mountain biking. and there is absolutely no way... British cycling does that. It definitely doesn't permeate through to, to the majority of, of mountain bikers. Yeah, I think um, there's a sense that when we tried to start Open MTV, there was a feeling that all the groups were working hard enough within their own areas. So trying to pull that all together into a national body was that was very, very difficult because they're working hard, so hard in their local areas that they haven't got time to be doing, you know, a bigger thing. So Cycling UK tried to help out. British Cycling did a bit, but uh, it wasn't great. So I think our, our biggest a, a, a problem is that we don't have a national body. I think that would be, you know, the discussion we had earlier on, Tommy, about... <clears throat> getting a piece of legislation that says, if you do something dangerous, it's down to you. You know, if we had national body, we could join with the BMC with other um, uh, national bodies and we could push the government to do that. But at the moment, yeah, it, it's, um, it would be great if we did have one. Uh, I yeah, I think there'd be so many, many benefits. Um, you know, it gives us that lobby ability if we're going to look at wider access, that's going to yeah. be important to have that wider outdoor cohort who can speak to landowners mm. and, and, you know, push that liability thing in terms of insurance for trail building. Actually, the minute you form a club, you form a charity, you then got to pay uh, three grand a year in public liability. Mm. Yada, yada. Actually, if you had a BMC style thing, okay, could we do that um, through, you know, through just through buying power. So groups can go to them, and you get it sorted and they help underwrite it. But we're so far away from that at the minute. Um, we are. Even keep pushing from that, but we're just miles away from it. We are. Yeah, I think we tried to get Open TV going for over five or six years and they, they just didn't work. Which, which is a shame, but I think that um, local groups are beginning to have serious influence. And I think that's partly because, you know, you're getting case studies all over the place that people can then pick up on 
and say, oh, that's the way I want to go. And I'm going to think what you're doing in, in the Chibius, Tommy, that's, it's absolutely that. I'm assuming a bit of that will be in your film, but that needs pushing. What you're doing, what, how you're working with um, land animals is amazing. I mean, we're, we're lucky because it's, uh, you know, it's easy to just go and knock on the door and have a cup of coffee, you know, where, where we are. And it, and it, is, it is a circumstance situation. Um, it's, a, it's a massive county, but it's very rural. So everybody largely knows everybody. And that, that helps hugely. Um, you know, I don't think it would be so easy in, a, in a, an area that's, a, you know, more densely populated where, you know, not everybody knows everybody. Um, but, you know, there's other options, you know, as well. You can lease land. That's something we're having ongoing discussions with at the minute um, from a national body, oddly enough. Um, so, so there are, and we did a case study of Van Road Trails, actually, which would be the sort of last point I'll, I'll put on this for, for how you could structure it. And they actually lease their bit of land off Natural Resource Wales. And um, I think it costs them a thousand quid a year for their public liability. Um, it's free to access. You don't have to be a member of the club. Um, it's easier if you are. Um, and we went and did some filming there on a June Wednesday evening. I think there's about 60 people there riding of all ages and all abilities. Fantastic. Like, that's great. Absolutely mean. Um, wow. That's brilliant. I, I think, um, I hope a few people will check this out. I hope um, everybody who's, who's listened will share it. Uh, when when Matt puts it up on the chef website, because this conversation needs to carry on. Um, it, mountain biking could really go places um, if if we can get this conversation going. So Tommy, thanks about that. It's been a cracking chat. Um, and.